Professor Johannes Vogel, Director General for the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin, an integrated research museum which aims to produce excellent science, care for and develop its collections and serve as that bridge we heard about earlier between science and society. And Professor Vogel is also Professor for Biodiversity and Public Science at Humboldt University. It is great to have you with us, sir. The floor is yours. Thank you, Jackie. <laughs> Thank you very much <clears throat> for allowing me to speak to you here today. It's a really great honor. And um, I can see quite a lot of familiar faces in the room, so thank you very much for being all here. Um, what I would like to do is really congratulate the commissioner on the excellent ideas that he's put forward. I think these chime very, very well with where a lot of people in Europe and I think globally want to go. And Europe has, as the Commissioner said, the opportunity through its people, through its diversity, through its infrastructure, through its democracy, to really become a beacon for the change that science, in my opinion, needs. And I would like to tell you probably a few things that you know, others to show you how when you nudge the system, when you create opportunities, society will rally and science will actually be um, inspired by this change. So now I need to try to see whether I can yeah, work, there, work yes. the... So we all know about the challenges. We live in a knowledge society governed by science and technology, but in relation to the grand challenges, which are becoming ever more pressing for the world, where is the water, the food, the climate, and so on and so forth coming from, and no individual state, not even the EU, can guarantee to its citizens that all of this will be there in the future. We need to harness scientific and societal ideas and innovations to find the solutions. And these two things need to be brought better together. I also think that in a world where more and more decisions that are being taken have um, scientific underpinnings, we need a much more scientifically literate citizenry. And again, Europe needs to invest in that because that will sustain our democracy. Sheila Jasinov's term, no innovation without participation, will hold true for this century. And I believe that innovation can happen with participation. We have the new ways of communication. And from my experience, learning from a lot of failures, but nevertheless, I can assure you, the citizens as a whole want to engage in science. It's actually fun for them as well as for the scientists. So I think that innovation with participation is possible and that Open Science 2030, the vision that you may have read, which all revolves around nature, so I will talk a bit about nature, um, is actually already happening or can happen. Free and open, high quality, crowdsourced, focusing on grand challenges, shaping daily lives, these things are happening already and I think we can do a lot more to get further than that. But let me tell you what our knee-jerk reaction very often to grand challenges are, in my opinion. Look at climate change. Fantastic how the scientific community rallied around this huge issue. They created a model of the world on which we can look at and see what predictions we can make, what policy implications we can give. The currency in my opinion, is CO2 atmospheric pressure. That is what everything revolves around. Now, none of us in the audience have sensors as humans who actually can deal with CO2 atmospheric pressure. So we are very happy to have science and policy debating about this. Excellent science, good policy. Now we come to the issue of biodiversity. Again, the world got together, created a forum, the Intergovernmental Panel for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. The currency here is, if we are not careful, going to become monetarized ecosystem services. And that would leave people out because we have a lot of sensors that deal with biodiversity. We eat it, we drink it, we wear it. So we need to look at how with these grand challenges we can engage people we can take society with us because, as you know, some of the debate around climate leads actually to greater consumption because people 
um, feel fearful about it instead of seeing what they can contribute to alleviate the problem. And with biodiversity, we cannot have that happening. So fortunately, and now just a quick pun for natural history museums because I run one of these, there are plenty of us, as you can see here, and they are actually mapping where humans live. So here you have scientific institutions at the heart of society that also have a communication role and therefore some of these hybrid organizations I think should be better used to bring people and science together and we are already in many ways um, playing a part here. This is what we are doing to the world. Um, the red line is where we are currently. So in the last 500 years we've transformed the planet from a sort of type of Eden into a world that is now really serving our needs um, and we have to be really careful that this is all sustainable as you can see from the predictions. But it's not just nature that we alter, we alter, also alter ourselves. This is how the human demo demographics is going to change and as you can see from the countries it's affecting every continent. More and more people will be over 60 years and more and more people, and that is the outer ring, will live in cities. So in 2007 we transformed ourselves from a sort of rural species into an urban species. These are all things that we need to look at um, when we think about the future. And there was a very interesting article that I can really recommend based on an American think tank that used this picture here in relation to where is innovation going. Now I'm one of three world experts on the sex life of ferns, so therefore having a fern carrying the world um, has to be in my talks. But what you basically can see here is that the idea is that um, most of the innovation that really, oops, no, nope. anyway, so most of the innovation that really helps us today happened in the 19th century, like clean water, sanitation, and so on and so forth, that we then um, went digital, but now we may be looking at where to go next. And this is, according to the think tank, where um, growth in GDP linked to innovation is going. And again, you can see that um, roughly with the Second World War, innovation per capita peaked, and it's now going apparently to this study going back to the type of levels that we experienced in the late medieval times. So I think we need to really think about whether the current model that has been very successful is actually the model that is going to carry us forward and therefore bringing society in, looking at the way how science is conducted, I think um, is a good way forward. So science needs to be open to the challenge itself. We have certain success criteria as a scientist, and I've been through all of that, but I think we have to think about the way how we want to measure success in science tomorrow. We have to open science to participation. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. The process of science needs to become much, much more open at all stages. We need to train a new generation of these open scientists. We cannot just say we want a different system without putting in the training. Infrastructure, time, money, it was all mentioned here. A good plan. I think this is worth a moonshot because I think the challenges demand that we work differently. Business as usual, in my opinion, is not possible any longer. So here you have various forms of citizen science um, or citizen scientists. Um, and what you see here is that you have actually a broad um, societal layer that is interested in science. According to the BBC, up to 50% of society are interested in science either as passive or active observers. And the way how science has to operate in this ecosystem is to bring more people from passive observers to work actively in science. That is the role we have to do, not have people stuck in this hierarchy. And science itself is taking off. And this is where I think citizen science is a fantastic example to see how an open science agenda would actually also mushroom, balloon, grow and really develop. So here you can see how citizen science and acknowledgement of citizen science in top scientific publications has now taken off. 
Another interesting thing is that once you open science, you open interesting funding streams. So now science is not just supported any longer by government, EU, um, or agencies. You can see that a lot more people, a lot more ideas getting funding. So it breaks another barrier, science funding. For citizen science now, after about 10 years or so, we have global agendas in the EU, in North America, in Australia, um, in various member states. So grassroots momentum is building up very strongly. And for Europe, this is the latest map that we've created, 62 members, 21 countries. Some very great fun projects, all bottom-up developed. So if you want to know about roadkill in Austria, or water quality in Finland, or porcupines in Italy, um, you can find this all on the map. Some of these projects, especially when it gets to measuring fine dust with smartphones or water quality, has also to do with technical innovation. People develop small devices that actually really deliver data that help to make things happen. So it is from research sometimes to market, and that in a bottom-up innovation, and that the EU funds projects is really, really commendable, so do the member states. I think there's something really fun going on here. But what is important with all of this is to think about what the users want. Scientists can think very clearly, very well, about what they as scientists want, but that is not enough, and that is sometimes to the exclusion of others. We have to think what people want. And so, we failed with a number of projects, but this one was really a hit. Here, people wanted to know about the water quality of their rivers because they wanted to catch their trouts. The Environment Agency in the UK said, you don't have a science degree, you don't have a stake in this game. We trained them up. This led to a change in policy, stewardship of, of the water, and sustainable, self-sustaining programs on water quality. These are the type of projects we want. It does require initial investment. It does require buy-in from scientists, but then it goes. And out of this developed probably the largest um, science, citizen science project to date, which is still running in the UK. It's called Opal Open Air Laboratories. And up to date, 2% of the UK population have been actively engaged in science, and that within four years. So there is a huge potential out there. This is not passive participation, this is active participation. Um, disadvantaged areas and people, 20% of the 850,000, so it really reaches all strata of society. Of course, schools, organizations, and so on and so forth. But, funnily enough, it got a UK government civil service reform award. So it's perhaps science and administration that may want to think about how to be open to other perspectives. So my plea is straightforward. We can do it. There are societal ones. There are scientific needs, there are lots of open minds, advances in technology and communication, science finding new ways of working will lead to innovation with participation, and I think again that this um, summit here will demonstrate that this is possible, and I would like to thank you for your attention.